we're going to be discussing successfully implementing DevSecOps and some of the lessons learned here at Red Hat. My name is William Henry. I'm a Senior Distinguished Engineer, and with me I have... Hi, I'm Lucy Kerner. I am um, the Senior Principal Security Global Technical Evangelist and Strategist and lead the technical and go-to-market strategy for Red Hat, um, Red Hat for security across the entire Red Hat portfolio. So um, what we want to do is just, you know, jump right into the presentation. And uh, what we're going to talk about is um, not just, uh, you know, what is DevSecOps, but, you know, what are some best practices if you want to, you know, get jump started on DevSecOps. So the let's start with um, the, the slide that you see here. You know, why are humans bad at security? Now, this is the research done by Analyst Farm 451. Humans are bad at security because we think short term. Naturally, as humans, we think short term. And therefore, um, you know, we're constantly fighting fires. Um, prior to my current role, um, I spent three years as a senior cloud solutions architect for the U.S. public sector. And I honestly cannot count the number of times I went into a customer and they were in the middle of fighting fire, various fires, you know. Oh my God, Lucy, I can't figure out how this machine is configured. The person who configured the machine, they left the company and I have no idea, you know, what's going on with these machines and these systems. You know, oh my God, Lucy, we just updated the patch and it completely broke our application and we can't get it back up. Uh, you know, humans are bad at security because we devalue long-term risk. We think short term. And then, you know, this causes us to constantly fight fires. But if you want to be successful with cloud, containers, Kubernetes, DevSecOps, and this new way of developing secure applications and having that secure infrastructure, you cannot think short term. You have to think long term and collaboratively to be successful. So this is a um, you know, just various quotes that you see here from um, for various uh, research that has been done. You know, you see here, you know, the number of reported uh, the reported increased severity of attacks. It's it's constantly increasing the number of um, the severity of attacks. In terms of the time it takes to actually fix these incidents and these attacks, um, it takes longer to fix incidents. There's not enough people. You know, this is always the pain point that CISOs and C-level executives bring up. You know, I don't have enough people, whether it's enough security people, people in, that can do DevOps, people in the infrastructure and operations side, um, development, everything. So this is, this is even a problem that we have at Red Hat, you know, finding people who can do the work, hiring security staff, et cetera, right? You talk to any stock out there, any security operations center out there, you know, the, uh, the problem with the, you know, tons of alerts coming in and having alert fatigue, alert overload, you know, not able to actually do anything about the alerts that come in. You know, 5% of alerts coming in um, are, are actually examined because there's too many alerts from the 10,000 security tools out there, right? And this problem is that it getting worse with cloud and containers. You know, you're trying, if you try to do things the traditional way, right? Trying to log every single alert that comes in like you do in your traditional environment. This is just going to, um, you know, worsen the situation because you have a lot, you have a lot more containers and VMs, and then you're introducing things like microservices. So as more and more enterprises are moving to cloud, we're seeing more and more breaches as well due to the mistakes that people are making due to the short-term versus long-term approach to security. For example. Let's look at this Capital One breach. So this is um, this breach happened because of an insider threat. So you know, this was a formal former AWS engineer who um, who hacked into um, the Capital One uh, systems and did the, the uh, and, and was the cause of this breach, right? And so one of the things that really gets me about this breach is that the um, hacker actually. Um, uh, bragged about it on Twitter and you know posted the the all of that private data on and on her own personal GitHub. And then the way Capital One eventually found out was by an anonymous email that was sent to Capital One saying, you know, there appears to be um, some leaked S3 data of yours in someone's GitHub and then linked to the GitHub. And in that GitHub is the exact exploit and the, um, uh, and the actual zip file of all that dump of the S3 data, right? And so if we look at this uh, breach a little bit more carefully, 
I, you know, let's take a deeper look at this capital one breach. So most of the articles out there, if I'm sure you've seen it, right? It's, most of it is all fluff, um, with the exception of these two articles that I have here by Brian Krebs that I put the link to. Um, when you know, you can see the link there at the bottom left of that slide. So this hack started with the misconfiguration of the open source web application firewall, um, specifically mod security or mod sec. And as you can see from this diagram, um, this misconfiguration allowed the intruder to bypass that web application firewall, which would have restricted the traffic to that application network that you see there in the light, light uh, blue, right? The intruder was then able to send a request to the AWS metadata service over the public internet. And then from there, the hacker pulled those temporary IAM credentials and then used those credentials to make API calls to the S3 service. So this combined with that overly permissive admin IAM role um, on their EC2 host um, allowed that hacker to dump and download the contents of the S3 storage. And then, of course, that contained all of that sensitive customer data, which subsequently the hacker posted on their uh, her or personal GitHub page, right? Um, so this type of vulnerability exploited by the intruder, this is not from a cap um, but this Capital One hack. This is not some like weird, obscure uh, way to hack into um, systems, right? This is actually a, 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 ha a method called server-side request forgery that every hacker knows about. And this is where a server, in this case, Capital One's web application firewall, it can be tricked into running commands that it should never have been permitted to run. Uh, including those that will allow it to talk to that metadata service. So, you know, what are some of those lessons learned with this breach? Um, you need to have strict control and have very strict gaps between the application and the operations role and their credentials. And also, an automation strategy could have helped here as well. So, automation is it, you know, it will help improve security and compliance. It is also a prereq to DevOps and DevSecOps. So let's take a, the, um, the, the Capital One breach as an example, right? Now, I would have loved to ask Capital One, did they have an automation strategy in place for their infrastructure operations and application lifecycle? For example, you know, did they use automation to prevent those human errors like this, like this breach that we, you know, that, that just happened, right? Um, you know, for example, you know, was their infrastructure security and compliance codified in a language, in an automation language that everyone can speak and everyone can learn, you know, over a weekend, right? You know, so, for example, Ansible, it's just YAML. It's just a markup language that if you know JSON, you know XML, you can learn over a weekend, right? You know, was it used to an automation language um, in a consistent language across infrastructure operations, development, security, networking teams. Did they did they do that? Um, did, they, did they use an automation language like that? Did, um, did they did their web application? You know, the web application firewall configs are just .conf files, right? Were these .conf web application firewall config files just on the host, or were they codified in an automation language like Ansible, which is YAML? all under change control in something like a private GitHub repo. Now, was there a strict code review process to monitor the changes to these configurations so multiple eyeballs are on these configurations? You know, was there automated testing done? Was automation used for IAM roles assignment, right? The configuring these IAM roles with, and then verification and testing in place to ensure that the correct IAM roles were set. You know, you want to have that tight control over the configuration and IAM roles because if that could have prevented the capital, this breach, right, uh, potentially, and automation could have helped achieve this. So automation helps reduce these human errors, which are inevitable when a human enters the data center. Um, automation could have helped reduce, um, could help, could have helped reduce that risk, save time and money. It would have, it could have also allowed you to do continuous security and continuous monitoring. Automation allows you to base security in from the start. You're not doing this band-aid firefighting approach, right? And automation allows you to do everything as code as we just spoke about, giving you that repeatability, ability to share, ability to verify, and ability to audit, which are all key to doing security. And automation allows you to handle all of these alerts that are coming into the SOC. Now, by taking that proactive approach to remediating all of those alerts that are coming in, 
and automation allows you to improve both security and compliance. Again, this is which is that prereq to do to doing cloud containers uh, and DevSecOps successfully. It allows you to take advantage of that dynamic infrastructure um, that cloud technologies brings and allows you to um, you know recover quickly. As you see here from this quote uh, from Forrester, you the bad guys are using automation. You want to fight fire with fire, and automation as you see here you want to automate anything you can as this is what is reducing those human errors associated with many breaches that are seen and this is a direct quote from the 2019 and 2018 Verizon data breach report which I highly recommend um, all of you read <clears throat> 